Alright, looks like it's working just like the good old days. Even better now with the open air. Hey man, yeah. walk and watch him and watch him. Good evening, gentlemen. Last week we started a new discourse, a new topic, a whole new world, as Disney would say. We are studying a mimer of the Rebbe Rashab, a discourse of the fifth Rebbe of Lubavitch. Really, nominally, it's a Hanukkah discourse. It's what the mimer starts and ends talking about, is Hanukkah. In the middle, we talk about things that are timeless, of no particular time. We talk of things that are always and forever, including the unity of God. That's our main theme. Our main theme of the evening is the unity of Hashem, which as I believe we mentioned last week, and if we didn't, we'll mention it, we will mention it now, that the unity of God is different in Judaism and Hasidus from faith in God. Faith in God is about God himself, the nature of God himself, how does the soul relate to Hashem, and Hashem's nature, so to speak. And of course, as we know, Hashem's nature is what it is, it doesn't change, what we, what we could call his nature even, obviously, even the word nature is not really a word you can apply to Hashem, but the, the reality of God, God himself, is obviously eternal and unchanging. That's emuna. Emuna is the soul, the soul's faith relationship to God as he is eternal and unchanging. Achdus Hashem, the unity of God, which is what we talk about when, for example, we say the Shema, and also what we spoke about when we learned the whole second part of Tanya in this class, not so long ago. Achdus Hashem, the unity of God, means the interaction of God with the world. Not what is God's nature always and forever, what it was before the world was created and what it is after the world is created. Not God's nature, so to speak, as he is unto himself, but rather the relationship of God to the universe. What does it mean that there is a universe? How does this universe affect the reality of God? What changes does it mean to the reality of Hashem? In Hasidus, when we talk about Achdus Hashem, the unity of God, we mean the unity of God with the world. What is the relationship between the universe and God? And that's really what our Mimer is about. Our Mimer, our discourse, which is called Tanu Rabbanan Ner Chanukah, explores in a very clear and thorough and beautiful way the relationship between the universe and God. Last week we spent a lot of time talking about Hanukkah and the halachas of Hanukkah. We're not even going to review it because we'll talk about it more at the end. If anybody wants to review it themselves, review what we spoke about last week about halachas of Hanukkah, please go and see the video. You're free to and encouraged to. It was an interesting discussion about the various laws of Hanukkah. We said, in order to explain these laws of Hanukkah, we have to understand why the Hanukkah candles are called Neres Hanukkah. They're called the lamps of Hanukkah. And we explained that a lamp in Mishle, King Solomon, wisest of all men, compares mitzvahs to a lamp and Torah to light. He ner mitzvah v'Torah or You have the mitzvah, the commandment is the lamp, and Torah is the light. And we said, what does it mean that a mitzvah is a lamp? Well, there's two ways you can explain lamp. You could either say, in two ways it's explained in Torah. There's a the vessel that holds the oil and wick, or it's the oil and wick which holds the fire. Either one of these could be called the lamp. Either it's the, the, golden vet, the golden cup on the menorah which holds the oil and wick, or the lamp could refer to the oil and wick themselves. You find both of these interpretations in Torah. Either way, in order for there to be light, in order for there to be fire, you have to have a lamp. And as we explained, the light of the Torah depends on the lamp of the mitzvahs. You need the mitzvahs as the lamp to be able to hold or to, to, to have the light of Torah. And we said, what does that mean? In order to explain this, we have to go and speak at great length about other things before we get back to what it means that the mitzvah is the lamp 
and the Torah is the light. And by understanding eventually how the mitzvah is the lamp and the Torah is the light, we will then get back to understanding Chanukah. So that's the, 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 the process. This is what's called, I'll teach you a fancy word from the universities, which normally puts a bad taste in my mouth, but we'll just use the fancy word, which is it's called a chiasmus, which is a very fancy word for like a triangle, right? It's like nested um, in, in, uh, in, in, in programming, you would say nested functions, right? Or in mathematics, right? You have you have an outside, then you have something a story a story inside a story inside a story. But we're at the third level down. Now we have to resolve that story, and then we'll go up, back up the other levels. You'll see the mimer is very organized. In other words, every parenthesis that the Rebbe Rishab opens, the Rebbe Rishab at the end will close in the correct order. If you understand what I'm saying. So we began to discuss at this third level down here talking about Achdos Hashem, the unity of God we began to explain how mitzvahs are with physical objects in general in general you have tefillin is with physical leather mezuzah is with a physical parchment tzitzis is with wool the four species on, on Sukkot, of course, are with different plant life. In general, the mitzvahs of the Torah, there are some exceptions, which we mentioned last week, which may be debatable. In some ways, they really hold to this principle as well. In some ways, all mitzvahs involve physicality to different levels and different extents. But most mitzvahs require not just physicality, they actually require a physical object of some kind right to perform this mitzvah most mitzvahs are this way it requires some kind of physical object we mentioned trumas and maestras right we don't even nowadays we don't even talk a lot about the vast number of agricultural mitzvahs in the torah which all have to do with physical objects right land fields right and eretz yisrael more of course we now nowadays we talk about like truma and maeser and things like that the vast majority of the torah's mitzvahs all the mitzvahs of the base of mikdash kimat have to do with objects Right, all the mitzvahs in the temple, almost all the mitzvahs have to do with physical objects. Then we ask the question, what is a physical object? Hmm. And as we mentioned at the end of last week's class, the best way to really approach this mimer, this is just a note about how, the, it, how to get the most out of these classes that we're going to do on this mimer. Just, this is a step back for a second. The best way to approach these classes is to approach it that the Rebbe is going to give us all the information that we need. In other words, the Rebbe is going to ask what is a physical object, and the Rebbe is going to explain it for our purposes, all the purposes that we need in this mimer. In other words, the way you learn the mimer is there's a flow of ideas, and those ideas are organized in a very precise way, and the Rebbe will give us all the tools we need to answer all our questions at every step. In other words, it's productive to think of the Mimer as almost a self-contained world. Because the problem is, is that if you think about the Mimer and all the concepts we're talking about, just as they relate to your entire experience in your whole life, like if I ask you, what's a physical object, right? Well, you could have a billion answers to that question. You know physical objects very well. Your whole life you've known physical objects. The problem is, is that the Rebbe Rashab is trying to show you a new and a precise way of looking at physical objects, and the Rebbe will answer his own question. The Rebbe will tell you, this is what a physical object is. Now, not everything is in every mimer. In other words, you have to learn, you have to be a bit klug, chassidim are klug, right? The Mittel Rebbe famously, klug is Yiddish for clever, smart, right? The Mittel Rebbe famously said, I'll tell you a... Uh, I'll tell you a bit of, uh, I'll tell you a radical line from the Mittler Rebbe, and I won't explain it. We'll leave it for something to chew on. The Mittler Rebbe said, My job is not to make Hasidim frum, to make them religious. My job is to make Hasidim klug, to make Hasidim smart. Mashiach will make them frum. That's what the Mittler Rebbe said. My job is to make Hasidim smart, not religious. Mashiach will make them religious. My job is to make them smart. That's what the Mittler Rebbe said. I don't know what that means myself, please don't ask. We'll chew on it and think about it for later. You have to be smart. Chassidim are klug. Chassidim are smart, right? What, part of what it means to be a smart chassid is that when you learn the mimer, you realize that not only is not everything in one mimer, but maimarim give different answers to the same question, right? The mimer in Tanur Rabbanan Ner Chanukah about the, the, the answer we give about 
what is a physical object here is not going to be the same answer necessarily in every moment. Right? And the fact that the answers are not all the same doesn't contradict anything. On the contrary, you have to think of the mimer as like a... It's a process that the Rebbe is leading you on, right? It's not a, it's not a, a, a general comment on Torah truths at random, in which case you'll get very frustrated very quickly because the Rebbe is only saying very precise things about very precise topics. Rather, what's going on here is that the Rebbe, the Holy Tzaddik, is trying to take you on a very narrow and precise path to a certain view that his soul has of godliness. So in other words, it's very beneficial. It's very, the smart thing to do is even though we know what it, we, how these questions are answered in other Maimarim and in other places, if we want to follow what the Rebbe Rashab is saying, and it's, it's, it's very important because if you have all these other things that you think are true, you get totally lost. You totally lose the point the Rebbe Rashab is saying. You have to follow him step to step to step. That's just a note about how to get a lot out of learning the Maimarim of the Rebbe Rashab. Because the Rebbe is taking us somewhere. It's not just, it's not, every point is not a point in isolation to be taken in every which direction. Every point is one step on a journey pointed in one direction. So you have to follow the Rebbe where the Rebbe is taking you in the Maimarim. It's generally good advice. Anyway. So he asked, what's a physical object? That's how we got on that whole discursion, right? And he says, he tells us, what's a physical object? A physical object is something that God creates through the name Elohim. We know God has different names. These different names describe different things that God does. A physical object is something that's created through Shem Elohim, right? As we see in the Torah, when God is creating the physical earth, as we read in last week's parasha, what name does it use over and over again in the first chapter of Bereshis? It uses the name Elohim. God is called Elohim, right? In the very first verse of the Torah, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The name of God that is used is the name Elohim. And in general, we said Elohim is when God is speaking. Elohim is when God is speaking. We are describing God in the act of speech. Now, I want to take, I want to take, before we go further in the text, for those who are in the text with me, we are on the second side of the two sided text, uh, page Lamed Vav in the Hebrew. It's in the th we're in the third paragraph on the page, the bottom paragraph. That's where we're going to be. We're about halfway through that paragraph. But before we get into the text, before we get into that text, I want to take a step back. <clears throat> a step back, hopefully, to take us two steps forward. <sighs> Do we believe that when God creates this physical universe, right? Let's use a stone. A stone's a very simple object, so we don't get confused. Let's use a stone. When God creates a stone, does God have to go through a process to create that stone? Why does God have no processes? He's creating something from nothing is a very good point. I don't know what that that itself requires definition. What does it mean he creates something from nothing? What does he need a process? Is the first question. He doesn't. We have to surmise he doesn't need a process. Why do we have to surmise he doesn't need a process? Hashem can do whatever he wants to do. That's a very good, that's a very good point. He's beyond time. That's another very good point. In general. In general. The need to create something with a process is a limitation, in general, in general. Why should I need to go through something other than just having or producing the thing that I need? The reason we go through processes is because we're limited. And you made a very good point when you said he creates something from nothing, Really, when we say God creates something from nothing, that is a different word. That's a different way of saying this fact. 
that God creates without a process. That's really what it means, something from nothing. Something from something means God needs, you need ingredients, right? Like, go make me a cake, right? So let's say a cake, you have uh, chocolate, eggs, and flour, right? And then, of course, you also have the, the, the heat that you have to have, right? And it has to be in an enclosure so that it bakes properly, etc., etc. All of those things, and it has to be mixed and mixed in a certain way, all of those things contribute to the final reality of this cake, right? That's something from something, right? In other words... In other words, my finite reality that I am that 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 I am producing is a bunch of different things that already exist put together. When God creates something from nothing, what do we mean when we say he creates something from nothing? He creates something from nothing is almost a paradoxical statement, right? Because if it's him creating, what do you mean it's from nothing? He's creating right what do you mean from nothing is it from nothing or is it him creating right and the answer is what we mean something from nothing is not that god is not doing it god forbid it's not that god isn't the one that's doing it what we mean is that there are no prerequisites there are no ingredients to the thing that is produced which the human mind cannot really comprehend by the way oh, it's very difficult he was there. Yeah. So he actually converted parts of himself, if you can even say no, that, part. into material. You can say part. Uh, no, I mean, it's I interesting know. that you say he converts part of himself into no, the I material. Mean, That's an interesting statement. We're going to get back to that in a minute, I think. I think. But there was a process. But... Al is right. That's, in other words, that's the difficulty with something from nothing. That's why you have to actually think about what does it mean when we say God creates Yeshma Ayin, ex nihilo, something from nothing. Because it's not from nothing. We don't believe in nothing. God is not preceded by nothing. Before, there, before in, we say in, in Hasidus and Kabbalah, before nothing even exists, there is God. Right? Before there is even a potential for nothing, there is God. The potential for nothing, or nothingness as we would call it in our reality, is a creation of God, is what we actually say in Hasidus and Kabbalah. Right? Everything is created from God in one way or another, exactly as Eyal said. So what does it mean that it's created from nothing? And the answer is that when it is created from God, it's not in a way of a process. In other words, however it comes from God, I'll say, put it in a different words for you. When it comes from God, it's caused by God, right? When I bake the cake with all the ingredients, the cake is caused by all the ingredients put together, right? When God creates the stone, the stone is also caused by God. The difference is, the difference is, it's one slight difference and it makes all the difference in the world. The difference is, is that when God causes something to happen, he can cause it to happen if he wants to at a distance. That's the difference. God can cause something to happen in a way that he is not an ingredient of the thing. To us, this is not comprehensible. All our causality, just let me finish the explanation and then, and then we'll discuss. When we cause something, like when we make the cake, right? We can only cause things by being in a relationship of cause and effect with them, a close relationship of cause and effect with them. In other words, if you take that final result, which is the cake, and you trace it back to what went into it, there you would find us, right? We made the, this cake could not be here without my contributions. There's the eggs contribution, there's the chocolate contribution, the flour contribution, the oven contribution, my contribution, right? To put all these things together in an organized way, right? You trace it back, you'll find all the contributions that went into it. God has a way of causing a stone to come into being, even though he is the one that's causing it, he has a way of causing it to come into being where there is nothing to trace back. In other words, he, has a, he creates it, but without having any relationship to it. He creates, but from a distance. And in fact, in Hasidus and Kabbalah, it's explained, the, f the less God is known to the thing, the more it is created. Which in our world is impossible. There is no such thing in, in human reality. 
in human reality, the more the ingredients are felt in the effect, the more real the effect is, right? If I put more eggs in, I'll get a bigger cake. If I'm a better baker, the cake will be a better cake, right? When God creates, because he is infinite, because he can create at a distance, it means this thing can come into reality, and the, f the less you feel God in it, the more real it is. The opposite of when we make a cake. That's what it means to create something from nothing. So the answer to the question of does God need a process to create is no. Creating something from nothing means that there is no process. It means God can bring something into being without a process connecting God to that thing. Questions and discussions and concerns, uh, please. By the order. Uh, I go, I, so, so the Kayan should speak first. <laughs> the older Kayan. They're led to Indian. So here's here's my question. Yeah. He doesn't. A comment first. A comment. I'm, and I, I think this is from Hebrew school. I think my Hebrew school teacher, Carl Worman, uh, taught me this. God creates. Man can only make. Correct. Correct. When the Torah says create, it means something from nothing. Another point that we're going to be touching on in a minute. Right. So here's my question yeah. about the process. We, we learned constantly in Tanya that the Shekinah is in the rock. Right. That's what Al said. Al said God makes God makes the world from parts of himself. Interesting point. No, yeah. but, but that, that's even, it, it's even at a higher level. Because you said that he made it in a way that he's not going to be in it. I didn't say that. No. I said he create he created it in a way where he's distant so from So is that the, no, but, but so that's, that's need a problem. problem. My question is, or it seems like, I understand he doesn't need a process, but it seems like he used a process. Oh, that's the next question. That's that's a separate issue. No, but even more, so, I mean, about what you said, I mean, you said that the Torah was written like 2,000 years before the world was even created. In that case, there is some sort of a process, because if it was made the Torah, then he created it. But this is not what good, good point. But that's good not point. necessarily the process of creation. But it's like I mean, it's, it's stages. a series it's of events. Stage no, it's but there's but every stage could be created entirely independently. But you haven't fully it thought it through it this idea of something from nothing. If you think through, actually, I like this point, so I'm going to talk about it for a minute. If you think, so you say, because the Torah is created before the world, so there's some kind of process. Because first you have nothing, then you have the Torah, then you have the world. But if you think about it. The fact that God creates something from nothing means that there is no developmental process required for anything to come into being from God. In other words, if things do happen time-wise, right, if you have at stage one you have only the Torah, and then you have a stage where there's a world, right, the first stage can be created directly by God as is, and the second stage can be created directly by God as is. One doesn't have to necessarily follow need, from the God other in that way. God can create the world. He made it in such way. But God can create. Way, he, God he, can he, create he, the world in such a way where it's a direct act of uh, act of creation. So why did he do the door before? He used a process, but he didn't need to do it. He, have a he can do whatever he wants. That's, 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 that's about yeah. the, the next point. question. Well, yeah. No, so I need to finish. But in that case, so we look at that pole or whatever thing. It's. We cannot say that God is not the inter. Even though he made it remote, or he made himself remote of it, you cannot say that God is not the inter. Because everything which is like either physical or spiritual, God is the inter. Why do you say such a thing? Maybe he just created it, maybe God's not in there. Because God is creating all the time. Like yeah. every second is creating. But, I mean, we said that but, if, but if the act of creation is something from nothing, and God is at a distance from the thing, right? who says God is in there? He's made the thing something else. In That's not case, God. I mean, there are some places in this world there's no God. What? I'm saying we're, we're speaking speculatively. We're not. I understand. Well, you understand I mean, what I'm saying? Can... Why not? The question I'm asking you is not what's the conclusion. I'm not asking you what you've learned in Tanya before. I'm asking you to explain to me why it must be that way. That's the thing. That's what we're doing tonight that you don't do when yes, you learn Chitos. The, like, <laughs> the question is, the question is, Al says God is in everything. I'm not going to disagree with Al because I read it the same place Al read it, right? The thing is, I don't want to, I don't want to have a discussion about what we both read. That's not an interesting discussion. I want to know why. Why does God have to be in everything? 
that's what that's what we do in the Thursday night Hasidus class that we don't do when we learn Tanya by ourselves. That's something you read somewhere. That's a pasuk, and no, the violation. Is, and the meaning of the pasuk that you read okay, so is explain. from the mimer. So I'll explain. Yeah. Because he's eternal. Yeah. And so. Yeah. There's no room for anything except for him. Who says? Who okay. says? Maybe no, he. Maybe in the act of creation, he makes room for something over there. What? What do you mean he's not eternal? No, what are you talking yeah. about? Are what are you talking about? Yeah. He's eternal. The creation is not him. The creation is not him. Yeah. He's eternal. The creation is not him. You know why? You know why I'm so good at arguing against you? Because this is a legitimate shita in Judaism. In other words, if you go learn the philosophy of the Rambam, this is exactly what you'll find. That's why I'm so good at arguing against it. It's very easy. I, I cheat. I actually cheat because I don't have to think. I just read a lot more. That's the difference. It's the difference. It's the only difference. I said the reason I can argue so well against this is because for many, many, many years this was the normative belief of Judaism. Judaism without Kabbalah. Judaism without Kabbalah. Judaism, the philosophy and theology of Judaism, before the Kabbalah was revealed and became the revealed theology of Judaism for all Jews, the revealed uh, inner aspect, the inner truth of the Torah, before that, if you went and read the Rambam's Mor and Vuchim, for example, if you read the Guide for the Perplexed, it would tell you exactly as I am saying. Not that there's... There, why, can, why does God have to be in everything? God creates, and the creation is separate from God. God doesn't have to be in everything. Whoever, whoever heard of such an idea before Kabbalah? Whoever heard of such an idea? In fact, some might even say the idea that God is in everything sounds a lot like idol worship. It's telling me a stone has God in it. God is absolutely infinite, unchanging. He preceded the entire world. The stone is not infinite and unchanging and preceding the entire world. How can you say God is in a stone? No, you can say that, but you're not praying to the stone. You're praying to the God. Oh, no, maybe, maybe because you've made oh. a no, maybe no, no, but maybe because you maybe because you've made a mistake of judgment. If God's in the stone, maybe you should pray to the stone. No, but we have to take information. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if that was going to happen. What happened? All right, we are going, going to pause and restart this recording.